folks, um, I was going to do this at the end, but uh, since we're still uh, getting ready to go, I just want to take a minute to say hello, and um, I'm uh, the organizer for the local, and we've been doing sort of member-to-member -member organizing, basically going out and talking to each other, uh, usually during lunch times, and uh, uh, we're calling it rounding, the health of the union, uh, union rounds. So uh, there's a few people here that have uh, done that already, if you could just sort of identify yourself and maybe... Take a second to say what you felt, what what you experienced. Well, I got one fair dues share person switching over to a full paying dues member, so I was pleased with that. Oh, Thea. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Thea Gillespie. I'm on a financial aid council chair. Um, and when I went out, we actually, I believe, gained a couple of reps by chance. Um, which is all Mark's doing, I just got <laughs> But it kind of just opened my eyes, really, um, about the union, gaining more information about the union. And as a council rep with a small office here on campus um, that does a lot for the university, um, and kind of being fairly new to the university um, this year in my third year here, um, it just really opened my eyes to how great the union is. So, that's my two cents. <laughs> more experience we had went to everybody was for the union. So they were, you know, they felt that they felt that the union was advantageous to be in. So those were mostly positive responses. But I was telling Mark that I wanted to encounter someone that was maybe you know, kinda of on the fence or kind of, you know, on the other side so I can know how to um, talk to that person and um, kind of sway them over to some of the benefits that we all know are great, right? So that was good. It was good to meet different people and different faculty and to, for them to know, for the faculty to know who we are as well. So I think that's important as well. I'm Elizabeth Kendra, an advisor in engineering. Um, I'm very new, so it was a good experience for me because I was definitely intimidated by the idea and wasn't really sure what I was getting into. Um, but it was a really good learning experience just to learn more about the union myself and then learn from Mark how to discuss it and promote it and um, share all the benefits with others. So I would really encourage um, a lot of the new and you know, academic staff to go out and do it because you will learn a lot as well as um, share a lot. So thank you very much. And uh, so after, the, after this uh, session, Please come up and talk to me if you're interested in going out and we can schedule. I've got a lot of scheduling to do, um, but please uh, talk to me afterwards. Thank you again, everybody. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to our Academic Staff Steering Committee presentation on everything you need to know, want to know about selective salary. Um, we're so pleased that we have such a great turnout um, and want to remind you that we are having our next event in February. Sorry, I don't have the date offhand. Does any of the committee have the date on offhand? It's in February. You'll be getting an email notice about we would really appreciate it if you would register for the event as opposed to showing up unregistered simply so that we make sure we have enough space and food for everyone. Um, our presenters today are going to introduce themselves, but I'll just tell you their names. We have Ricardo Villarosa, Dr. Vanderweg, and Kristen Chinnery. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Mary Anthony. Um, Ricardo Villarosa, I'm a grievance coordinator for academic staff. I'm in the Dean of Students office now. I'm an academic advisor for, uh, been here for about 15 years, was at the law school for a long time. And have served on promotion and tenure committee at the university level a few times and also at the Division Student Affairs Selective Salary Committee. Hi. I'm John Vanderweg. I am Associate Provost and Associate Vice President for Academic Personnel. Um, I, my main duties in the Provost's office are working with the three academic unions, GEOC, UPTF, and AUPAFT. Um, I tell my students that I found it hard over my career to hold a job. This is my fifth institution 
I started teaching as a full-time faculty member in a long time ago um, at Douglas College in the music department of Rutgers University. Um, I have also been assistant dean for undergrad studies and in the theory department at the University of Michigan School of Music, uh, director of the DePauw School of Music in Greencastle, Indiana, 11 years or so at the University of Texas in San Antonio and in various faculty and administrative positions. And I came to Wayne State in the summer of 2001 when there was more money in the state of Michigan than anybody could believe. And of course, seven weeks later, there was no money in the state of Michigan. <laughs> so it was a masterpiece of timing. I also managed to move to Texas just as the uh, early 90s oil bust happened. So I don't have great timing sometimes when I change jobs. But I have been at Wayne State, as I said, since 01. Um, I have been variously associate dean for faculty affairs, senior associate dean in the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts. I served for eight plus years as chair of the Department of Music. And I moved to the provost's office in June of 2013. Hello, my name is Kristen Chittery. I am an archivist three at the Ruther on campus. I have been at Wayne for 13 years next week. My anniversary is February 3rd. Um, I also serve as chair of the AAP Council um, as the leader of the council rep. Um, many of you are here. We are going to start with answering the questions that you guys submitted on the email. There was a call that went out a couple weeks ago, and we received a number of questions, so we're going to start with those. If you have follow-up questions on anything that we talk about or questions um, specific to your own situation, if you could save those until the end, because we want to make sure that we get through this first list um, before we can any more questions. That would be great. So first, um, can you please explain the selective salary review process? <laughs> you want to start? <laughs> you want me to start? You... you. <coughs> Well, it is, um, it has a primary purpose of reviewing the academic staff, providing peer review for the academic staff to recognize in a tangible way excellence in job performance, um, professional activity and service. And the tangible way is that those excellent ratings by your peers are translated into certain amounts of merit salary money uh, that is applied in August of each year. The secondary purpose, and I want to really say that it is a secondary purpose, is for peers to identify any of their colleagues who may be performing at a less than excellent or substantially less than excellent um, level and offer those people ways to improve their job performance. And primarily, the focus of the selective salary review is on job performance. That's where the greatest weight is given, and um, it is where we are most concerned that everyone is working toward or already achieving a level of excellence. And we'll talk more. Some of our questions come up about both of these areas. So Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Can we have more information about the specific scoring systems that are used for academic staff in that process? It varies. And you'll, unfortunately, a lot of our answers will say it depends, it varies, but within those, there's some guiding things that we'll, 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 we'll try to get and give you, arm you with the, the right questions to ask so that you don't just have to always go say, well, it, it depends. We have, we're structured in schools and colleges, interchangeably, divisions and not uniform structures. For example, you've got enrollment, the, the financial aid, and um, 
admissions are under an umbrella of enrollment management. There's the different units that report up through the Division of Student Affairs. And then there are the colleges and departments. Within those, there are, in almost all cases, a top unit level committee. So the, the college level committee, the division level committee. There are a couple of exceptional areas. The School of Medicine is one. Um, law had been, but I think it's back on. But in, in general, we have a structure that, that goes up to those, those large committees. At that level, there are numbers um, for, for scoring. And it, it varies in some places to have money. And I'm, I'm rambling a little bit here. In some places to have money, you are either a one in professional in job performance, professional achievement, and service, some places it's a 1.5, and that's where the variation comes in. Yeah. The committees, the colleges have conversations on two levels. One, what do we want for this cycle um, to award money for? And that's a conversation that can be had every year. Very often, we find that it's just, well, this is the way we've always do it. And so in some places, that it, it, does, it isn't a conversation. And so people start to think that it's established and it must be tied to some something in the contract. It's, it's been evolved in the different places. Um, I think there's maybe more to add. And to then, yes, uh, I'll add to that. Uh, each area that is conducting selective salary reviews for staff will receive either late tonight or early tomorrow there, there is an annual document called the Guidelines for the Evaluation of Academic Staff for Selective Salary Consideration. These are issued by the Provost's Office. Read that. They're issued by me. Um, typically, I will engage in some consultation with um, the AUP. And we reworked these guidelines pretty dramatically last year in uh, cooperation with the two sides. The <clears throat> it is a detailed document. I think it's grown to six pages. It will be available on the Provost Office website in its own folder, Selective Salary Materials. Within that, there are two folders, Faculty, Academic Staff. So you can find the cover memo that goes to the administrators concerning the selective salary process, as well as this year's guidelines. I think that we'll have them on our website tonight, but beginning tomorrow you should be able to find them after, maybe late tomorrow afternoon. Um, they are distributed electronically to all of the units. It's not secret information. That's why it's posted on our website. If you have questions after you've looked at the guidelines documents, feel free to contact Ricardo. Feel free to contact me in the provost's office. Um, I think that over the years that we have been refining these, they are quite straightforward. I will say, however, that the contract has one very specific requirement, and that is that how, how is the merit pool established or selective salary pool established? What happens is in late May, the provost budget officer draws, uh, pulls a picture of the current AUP represented staff. Doesn't matter funding, where the funding source is or anything else adds up their total salaries and multiplies it by 1.25%. That establishes the university-wide pool. The pool is then allocated out to the units based on the number of staff and the amount of staff salaries in those units. That's typically on, as Ricardo said, a school, college, divisional basis. At that point, the unit higher level division school college salary committee has some information about, okay, here's the total pool. If we do our allocation based on one rankings only, how will we split up the pool? It has to be divided four-sevenths for job performance, two-sevenths for professional achievement, and one-seventh for service. So within that total pool, 
a little bit more than half is devoted only to job performance excellence. Less than half, actually, two-sevenths to professional achievement and one-seventh to service. That's the discussion that will occur within the uh, upper level salary committees. Here's the pool. How do we want to break it up? They also undertake a review of the lower level rankings, but it's really the upper level committee that establishes the final ratings for each of the staff in that area and helps the administrator to determine the breakup of the funds. <laughs> so rankings in each of the three areas well, for job performance can run from 1.0 to 4.0. One is high, and we allow 0.5 increments. For the other two areas, the rankings run from 1 to 3 in 0.5 increments. Again, one is always high in this system. So there were several questions um, about the different documents that are required um, to turn in for the evaluation process, um, what those are supposed to look like, specifically the three-year summary. So what are the documents, and why is it a three-year summary <laughs> and not just a one-year explanation of what you've done? Okay. Um, I'll start. Ricardo will probably follow up. There are... Th there are three parts, but parts two and three are really related. The first part is an updated university professional record dated and signed. Okay. Every, if you don't know, if you're brand new to Wayne State, you don't know what the professional record is, talk to your colleagues in your unit, talk to your direct report supervisor. They are on various websites. It is a standard university form that everyone hates. Okay, let's just start from that standpoint. <laughs> Nobody likes it. It was both collectively determined through some negotiations, but it was all, it's also an animal of the academic senate. Getting it changed. I had this bright idea three years ago and talked to the provost about it, and I said, you know, could we change the professional record and make it a little bit more user-friendly? And she just sort of rolled her eyes and said, neither one of us will be at the university long enough to accomplish this. So the professional record is what it is. You don't have to have something in every little nook and cranny of the professional record. You can leave parts blank or say N.A. or whatever. But it is the document that is used for selective salary reviews, for those of you who are on the ESS track or tenure track, um, it is used for the annual evaluations. It is also used as you apply for ESS or tenure or when you apply for promotion. So grab that off one of the websites, put it on the desktop of your computer, and every time you do something that fits into that, put it on that copy of the, of the record. And a, a brief commercial. You know, those of you who have been around for a while know that we, we often do a workshop similar to this in this time frame for professional record. This year the ASSC is sponsoring a more comprehensive, hands-on workshop that will be coming in March, and that, that's not already been, it, it, I think it's been put up as a date. Um, because that comes up because it does touch on so many of our topics. So the leadership of ASSC is, is carving out a special time. So those who are interested can, can dive into more deeply. So you'll hear, we'll hear about that uh, later from ASSC. So the second and third parts, which I said are interrelated, have no template. They have no common format. It asks each person to highlight <coughs> their past three years of activities in job performance, professional achievement, and service. And then ask, what are you doing right now? What's in progress right now? And what will you be accomplishing in the near-term future? So it's not a big document. My, my staff in the music department used to call it the five greatest hits list. And we really did. Bullet points are fine because you're referring to information that's probably in the professional record. You're drawing people's attention to what you believe 
are your best accomplishments over the period of evaluation. It's a three-year evaluation because both <clears throat> the union and the administration understand and agree that bad years happen. You got sick. You weren't on the job for a full year. Um, you changed jobs, perhaps. This three-year period smooths out those really low points and really high points and really gives everyone a good longer-term window to look at in the three areas. The only thing I'll add to that is the language that, that this comes from is actually from the contract in the guidelines, and much of the guidelines, the provost guidelines, are taken directly from the contract. There are parts where the contract doesn't address it specifically, and then those become the, the, are the provost guidelines. As, as John said, we, we work together, so um, when if the union sees something that doesn't seem like, an op, like it fits, we have a, an ongoing dialogue. In fact, it's been, it was going on this week. It's been, it was gone on extensively after the new contract um, was implemented. And so it's, it's an ongoing process, and, and that works fairly well um, for us. The, the piece about the presentation, this is it hasn't been coming up as much now. People are getting used to it. But the language that said um, three years of academic staff members' activities and, C, a presentation of current activities. Early on, People were wondering what kind of presentation that was, and we're, the word presentation took us all into PowerPoint land and, and wondering what this thing looked like. I think now that's fading away as a question. Yeah. If anybody new looks at it, just know it's 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 just part of that one thing. It's that professional record. It's really two things, yeah. but within the t within the second piece, there's two components. Thanks, guys. So since we're talking about the guidelines, the guidelines at the provost's office distributes list evaluation standards. Our factors also list evaluation standards. How do those two documents work together? Or don't they? Uh, no, they do. Um, and they are supposed to. Um, and let me read. Um, It's three change. Yeah, that's right. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Yeah, so I asked, um, so in the, the provost guidelines that are distributed for the process evaluation standards are outlined, our individual unit or department or college factors also list evaluation standards depending on our classification. So I asked how those two documents do or do not work together. And John said they do, and now he's going to say yes. why. So the language that is contained in the guidelines is that the standards for evaluation are those set forth for promotion and tenure slash ESS in the collective bargaining agreement between the university and the AUPAFT and shall take into consideration such unit, school college, and university factors are in force. There is a standard university factor statement for academic staff. It's, again, it's on the provost website. It, <clears throat> it was a summer project that Ricardo and I were going to work on, and we didn't. Um, we will get, get it updated <laughs> um, because it has some wrong cross-references to the older contract. But... It does exist. Substantively, it has not changed, and I don't think we will be changing it. Um, each of your units, whether that's a school or college, a division, should have established factors statements for promotion and tenure. Those are the factors that we're really talking about. It's the university factors and the, and the unit factors that say for an archivist one to move to archivist two, for example. These sorts of activities are expected. Maybe not each and every activity. It's not really a checklist, but it, they will list representative activities. For moving from an archivist two to archivist three, there will be a different set of expectations, and three to four, a fourth set of expectations. The guidelines then say, typically, you will be ranked in group one 
if you are providing excellent performance and would clearly qualify that you're among the best in your job classification in similar national research universities and would certainly qualify for promotion to the present rank. Then it moves down. Group two. In most areas of job performance or whatever the category is, you're doing very good work, excellent in many areas, maybe not quite excellent yet in other areas, and you would qualify for promotion to your current rank. Group three especially in the job performance, says you might not qualify for promotion to your current rank. And group four says you would not qualify for promotion to your current rank. So that's how we make those gradations and how we ask the committees and the administrators who do this ranking to make those gradations. In the one point that was mentioned by John, and it's, it's actually... It has its foundation in the contract, too. We put factors, whether the university, college, or department, and know that those college and department factors were at one point developed by the pe your peers. By you guys. And then approved by the administration. So they are, they're not an arm of the administration or the union. They're, again, a, a part of that collaborative process, peer-generated and, and then signed off on. So they should always be in some way consistent. The same way we have a university strategic plan and then you might have a department strategic plan. They may have different nuances, but they can't be wildly divergent no. on any no. critical points. Um, having said that, because there are a lot of places that are silent, it's really the committees, especially at the college level, where there is often an interpretation discussion of even these guidelines. There are specifics in here, but they're, as John said, they're not supposed to be a checklist. And so even though there are concrete, tangible guidelines, they're guidelines. And so within within different areas, there's still room for variation. One, looking to your, your individual factors, and if, they're, if those are silent, there's still a conversation. So it's important. As individuals, you don't necessarily have that opportunity to have that conversation, but you should work through your, whatever structure you have so, to make sure that you're aware of how your unit treats specific examples and what... Where those um, where those expectations are. Thank you. So this is kind of a loaded question. <laughs> what is the role of the administrator that you answer to in the selective salary process? Did everybody hear that? Okay. Who wants yes. to go first? I'll, the role. Well, there's there's a couple <coughs> different roles um, on an individual basis. Well, I'll start from the committee structure first, because the contract speaks to the committee structure. Yes. In the committee structure, the designee of the president at the college level or the division level, if it's the, the, the vice president, so whoever the lead administrator is in the committee on the selective salary committee, shares it for convening and, and discussion. And I've got to stop and myself vote. here. And, and vote. Yeah, because some of our committees that I've got to look. Some are, so it's with vote. And so it's one voice, one vote. That's the weight of the ballots being cast. Um, and there's sometimes there's a variation. Where there, again, this is where the, that dynamic, that dialogue. We have different levels of, of conversation or, or forcefulness with individual members and sometimes with chairs or deans who are up, sitting at their designees at that committee level. So there's one vote. That's contractually what it counts as. How that, work, how that plays out depends on the committee and and the, that, unit. That, that, that the unit, those dialogues. Um, individually, very often when we start to get down to your supervisors, especially if you're in an area where there's not a department level committee, that second level that often exists but very often doesn't exist, then your supervisor may be reading your, your packet and, and sending that evaluation up to that, that highest level committee. Um, so they play, their role is a little more uh, influential on hand in putting forth your materials. I would, I would just uh, add to that, that in those departmental smallest unit groupings where there are not enough staff to constitute a salary committee, remember that 
yes, the unit administrator may be writing up the initial recommendation evaluation, but it's going to a peer committee at an upper level. So, yes, they may have a certain amount of greater power over that lowest level recommendation, but it, it's still going to be reviewed at an upper level committee that is populated by the peers. Um, so I'm in a department that only has two academic staff. My boss is going to be writing up my annual selective salary evaluation at the first instance, but those recommendations in that report will go up to my college committee that will have five to seven folks on it, shared by the dean or a designee, but again, as Ricardo pointed out, that's one vote among the seven or eight people that may sit on that committee. Our academic affairs committee has eight, I think, eight. has eight. <clears throat> rep, uh, elected out of the areas in academic affairs, plus one of the associate provosts. And it's such a large area that actually there are two associate provosts that share the chairing duties, but only one of them at a time, at a time votes. You mentioned something about the evaluation, and this is something where there is a degree, both on the faculty and the academic staff side, of difference. Very often, for many of us, what goes up from whether there's an individual supervisor or a departmental review is just the new, just the numbers, mm -hmm. just your scores in those three areas. There are some we've discovered both in the faculty and academic staff area where there's actually a written narrative. Now, the only the, where that becomes problematic is if it gets blurred with the annual review, which mm -hmm. John hasn't said yet, but we always say, and it's in the in the frequently asked questions. Those are two separate things. There's a lot of the same materials. Sometimes it's the same people involved, and so it's easy for those to be blurred. But your annual review, if you don't have ESS, is distinct and must be appropriately separate. Um, and so those usually have those have a narrative. Yes. So what you shouldn't see typically is a numerical with your annual review language right. going together. That doesn't mean, as we've discovered, in some places there are places where that Part of the selective salary process actually has a little bit of a narrative, and we've gone back and forth. And at this point, it's what's going on. The, the practice that takes place in those areas um, is what takes place. It's, it's, it's about the closest we've come. Um, uh, so you may be in a place that experiences having that written narrative. You may not. If there's a change, let us know because that's a new conversation. Yeah. Well, and then we're. Are we almost to the point where what's the difference between annual evaluation? And yes, you can go ahead. <laughs> How would we know, since that report goes to our dean and what's reported to us can just be our scores? Your college How would level committee. Know? Oh, it goes to the Check, college yeah, level. Yeah, if your college level committee. Okay. It goes to the college okay. level committee. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. I understand. Yeah. If your college level committee well, my is. My peers would see it. And right. Yes. Yeah. Say, oh, yes. there's a new yeah. thing this year. We've, we didn't get just numbers. We started getting written stuff to look at. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I understand. Uh, <clears throat> so the difference between annual evaluation, annual evaluation is addressed in Article 20 of the contract. It applies only to term-appointed ranked faculty, academic staff on the ESS or tenure track, so it's prior to achieving ESS or academic staff tenure, and faculty who are on the tenure track. As you're all aware, if you are in those situations, if you're on the ESS track, you receive a series of usually two-year appointments. Sometimes it starts with a one-year and then is followed by two two-year appointments. That's because leading up to the award of ESS, there's a five-year probationary period. Each year, often at about the same time as selective salary, you should receive, again, if you are in a unit large enough that there is a staff committee, the staff promotion and tenure committee should be providing 
again, chaired by the unit administrator, but at this time without, without vote, <laughs> uh, chaired by the unit level administrator, will work with the staff P&T committee in the unit to provide an annual evaluation still on the same three areas of concern, job uh, achievement, professional achievement, or job performance, professional achievement, and service. That is always a narrative document. Always a narrative document. The unit level administrator may add their own to that, but the evaluation is carried out by the peers. In those cases where there are not peers, where there's not a sufficient number to form a committee, the unit administrators are supposed to be consulting with the ESS or tenured staff in the unit to arrive at that a single annual evaluation. But as Ricardo said, it should always be a prose narrative evaluation. It should give you very good guidance that here are the areas of strengths, here are the areas where some improvement may be needed, here are some things that we would like to see you do over the next two or three or five years. Uh, that Those annual evaluations play into renewals of appointments, but not merit salaries. Now, as Ricardo said, there's a great overlap in the information that is needed. So many administrators say, you know, you don't have to turn in two professional records. We will photocopy it or we will use separate files for the two different types of evaluation. Um, they may ask or the department may say, we will also use your five greatest hits list because it's very helpful to have your input on these are my best things. Cer certain departments have also asked, where do you think you need to improve? And that's certainly a, a question that can come up in annual evaluation. The reason that it's a little odd is that there is overlap between the staff salary committee, which must have some people from the staff promotion committee on it, and the staff promotion committee. Each has some different membership, though. Okay. So there are three final kind of yes or no questions. We'll see how you guys do with the yes or no part. Okay, first of all, these are, and these are all specific to how the selective salary committees operate. The first one, if you are on a committee and you are not very familiar with the person that you're reviewing, are you allowed to ask either their supervisor or a colleague to provide written comments to the committee that you can use in their evaluation? Yeah, we talked about this. So that, that you, you said yes or no, but it's a, it's a no with a comma. So. It, it, it is really no comma. Uh, the materials that are required for the review are addressed in the contract. They're addressed in the provost office guidelines. And those are the materials that the committee should be using to review. I drew an analogy to the staff promotion and tenure committees, the highest level staff salary committees, there will always be individuals serving on those committees who are not intimately familiar with the people they are reviewing. We depend on the submitted evidence, and I often talk about this in promotion and tenure. The application for promotion and tenure or ESS is the evidence. <laughs> the factors are the what we weigh the evidence against. And the same is really true of the selective salary process. Yeah, when we look at it, what, what prompts the, the, the question sometimes is, well, if they only have these things to look at, they can't tell how wonderful I am or know the real me, that would be great. And that's where hopefully an opportunity to, to bring that out and the importance of bringing out the best package that you can present. And there, but there's also the flip side of it that's a little, that's not so friendly. That yeah. if we start, if that process was open to that kind of thing, then you could very well have people going and soliciting information that you really didn't think was fair and, and appropriate, and now it gets to be a little bit uh, unwieldy too. It becomes like hearsay evidence. I think there's only 
accept the question. Uh, that's right. My name is Denise Wonderland. Um, we had some difficulty last year in our unit with some hard feelings about the process. So one of the things that really came up was, is there any way to get more transparency from the higher level committees so that people can understand how decisions were arrived at? Yeah. Hold that question. Yeah, can we hold that question because there's a related part to that. Okay. Um, is it appropriate for the committee to use attendance in evaluating job performance? Again, no, no with a comma for... No for with a comma, yes. It's yeah. not a yes or no. Uh, it's not a yes or no. It is, Actually, it is a no. But it is a no. Yeah, it is a no <laughs> with a comma. Attendance is... will affect job performance, of course. That That's a given, because if you're not at your job, you're not performing your job. However... There are some specific instances, medical leaves, care of family members, things like that, that are also attendance, but those should not have a negative impact either on job performance. It's, when we were talking, we said there's, so if we're talking about attendance and you're talking about, well, I feel that there's somebody in my office who has chronic attendance problems and it just, they can't be work, they're working well and it affects how I do my job. We hear those sometimes. And those are real issues and those should be addressed. But remember, so not in the selective salary committee, which is, at first we're looking for excellence and then sometimes falling down on performance. And so there may be, those, those things can be addressed and should be addressed by management, supervision, um, if it's in an annual review, that's the type of thing that might come up there. Um, but again, because there's the, what part of your, what part of what's submitted to the committee would talk about attendance? And so if it, if it pops up as a, oh, well, let's single and not start having a conversation about attendance, that's not something that everybody's being checked on. It's not something that's being looked for and asked for in the materials that come forward. So attendance can be a real issue in a unit or department if it's if it's certain types of attendance issues. If it's the type, if this question was prompted by the sense that some of my our colleagues aren't working, they're not working as hard as I am. And so that's that to be addressed in other places. But let me be very clear, and I hope you have good relationships with your supervisors. If you become aware and Everybody's setup around campus is very different. I knew when my academic staff were at, in their offices and doing their work because it, we had a row of five or six offices. So when I went to my office, I saw everybody else who was working in the office. Many places can't be set up like that. Be honest if you sense that there is a co-worker. Be honest with your supervisor. I think there may be an attendance problem here. It is affecting my job because I'm having to pick up work that they're not doing. That's a supervisory disciplinary issue, not a selective salary issue. And I have one little thing. Yes, um, Yeah. Um, if the leave you're taking is FMLA approved, mm -hmm. it cannot be used as a negative factor. And so it's all, I mean, and then there's actually legal action that can be taken if it is used as a negative factor. So I often advise if you're in, on the ESS track and you need to take time off, um, so consider, you may want to consider um, filing for FMLA. You don't, it, as long as you qualify, because it has to be a serious illness serious illness of a child, a spouse, um, a parent, um, but, um, and, uh, you know, and, and I agree, um, you know, work on having a good relationship with your chair and, you know, make sure that everybody's aware. So, but if you are taking an FMLA and that comes up in selective salary, whether you're a committee member or an administrator, you got to watch out because that is, that's grounds for legal action against you personally. So, make sure you, um, 
Thanks, Mr. And I think that comes back to the very first thing that we both said was it's not an appropriate conversation for Southern Sally. No. It may be different types of absences, the, the two categories. The one that you're talking about shouldn't be something that, that comes up as a negative. Um, there are those that could be a negative that aren't a protected type of absence, but neither of those should be no. coming up as a, as a selective salary conversation. Okay. This is the last question, and this ties back to your question, Denise. Um, is the salary committee required to provide a <laughs> rationale for why they score a certain way if they're asked to provide that rationale? I will, because of the, the, ch the change of the draft that we just discussed, I'll let you start with, with that. Well, there's no contractual requirement. The contractual requirement is simply that the salary committee provides scores. Does it assist people at the unit level and at the college level to receive feedback from the committee? Yes, it does. So whenever uh, an administrator asks me in the provost's office, do I have to provide, or what do I have to send back to the, the folks? I said, at minimum, you have to tell them what their scores were. If you want to assist them, you can provide them with a brief prose description of that will help them understand why did I get the score that I got.
mean, that was a burning question. And when there's a conflict like that, how can we make that more transparent? Well, I think starting that, having that conversation with the top level chair is the place to start. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, when I served on the salary committee in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, whenever we scored someone below 1.5, because normally we do ones, 1.5 when we can, and then everybody scoring, scoring below that doesn't get any money. So whenever we have someone, a chair puts forth ones for everybody, and the committee looks at it and says, job performance we usually don't mess with. In the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, pretty much we just say, okay, who does know better than their immediate supervisor about their performance? Unless we've had this happen where the pros, the write-up, doesn't match the score. So the write-up says, you know, doing the job and everything, but they get a three, and that didn't make sense. So we as the committee will increase the score. We can do that. Um, but whenever there's a score that's below 1.5 in the College of Arts and Sciences, we ask somebody on the committee to work with that person so that the next time they go up, they won't have the same issues. So we, we, the whole purpose of it is, is not just to not to deny somebody their merit pay, but to let them know what they need to do to improve. And to your speaking to how can someone override a chair, we've had instances where in a department, everybody does outstanding work and then one or two people not so much. But they're all doing the same thing, basically. And there's no, we couldn't tell any real significant difference. So that said to us, there's favoritism a lot of times from the supervisor. So the supervisor might rate you a one and your colleague a three, and we couldn't figure out what, what was the difference, why it's, you know, so negative. So, but that's very rare. And know that there's also, at least in student affairs, there's one representative on the, the top level committee from each of the departments that is represented as well. So there is actually an additional voice, but again, that additional voice speaks candidly, and sometimes it is supportive, sometimes it's, it's not. Other questions? How do you find out who your committee chair was? How do you find out who your committee chair was? Um, at the college or unit level, contact your dean's law office. Typically, it is either the dean or an associate dean who's been designated by the dean. Again, uh, and this is sort of, it's an interesting phenomenon, it, and it's different at different institutions, with uh, only a few exceptions. We don't post committee memberships. My understanding of that practice is that is to keep the committee members from being politicked in the hallways by their colleagues, by the friend of a colleague, but it is to try to maintain the impartiality of the committee members. But if you were to ask as a staff member who chaired classes staff salary committee this year, either your direct report knows or they will find they can find out for you or they can refer you to the dean's office in class who will tell you. Any other questions? So, um, as uh, an academic faculty staff umbrella, um, is there, uh, because everybody's using, seemingly everybody, every unit and maybe college using different um, criteria, form, um, uh, factors, etc., um, paperwork, whatever, it seems like everybody's using a different um, Forms or format, but we're all under the big umbrella of academic expressive staff. So, is there a talk of maybe having like a universal um, format? I'm using the word format, but you guys get what I mean, I think. Um, to, to streamline everybody into using the same, even though given that it's every college, different college and unit, to streamline everybody to use the same kind of um, template or format so that there's more more consistency when they judge, when they're evaluating. I think really the purpose of 
the annual guidelines are to provide that consistency. And there's also, there's opportunities if you're in an area that doesn't seem to have a, a and you threw a, a, a lot of different things in there. Yeah. Factors, forms, processes. Yeah. Yeah. And so consistency seems like a nice thing to treat for if you're feeling that there's a complete lack of consistency. But the reality is, both, like most things, there's a spectrum. And what we, in the same way that on the teaching side, we don't have uniform teaching loads. It would be nice to say, oh, you can always have this, these three things, or this is the number of hours, this is the number of courses. And our contract on the teaching side recognizes that with a university as large as we have with all the different disciplines, that it, you're never going to get that comfort of the simplicity of it's all the same. Similarly, we have, with all of our different designations, we're all academic staff, but we have librarians, counselors, advisors, and even those things, there's not uniformity. As we, I was just talking to one of our colleagues who's working on a PhD, and said, can I find the document that says, what is, what is a, <laughs> what's an ASO? More important or what's an ASO? Right. You know, these things have evolved for better or for worse into where they are. So we, we strive to find things that can provide some consistency, some transparency, but recognizing that it's not just, we, we can't drive it to some uniform piece. If you're, if you're looking for a form within your unit, there's a lot of sharing that goes on back and forth between some of the bigger, more established units, and then you can take their forms and the way that they do things, and sometimes, and that's, that goes on a lot, mm -hmm. and you, if you're in a place where you'd like to see some of that, we can help <laughs> facilitate. The union leadership usually has some, like, which areas have, um, have documents or forms that help you um, not have to recreate that all the time, or to find some consistency or something that's worked in other places that you can adapt for yourself. I hope that gets to some of your... If anybody wants to see a, a sample form, send me an email. Um, we have one that we have used for years, and the salary committee, our salary committee routinely, you know, updates it and makes changes as we make decisions as a committee. Um, so if anybody needs an example, I'll be happy to share. Any other questions? I'm sorry, yep. I just had another comment. One, one thing that, you know, I, and I know that um, you have a point of view, you're shared in the two departments, you have the same job classification, the expectations are quite different. Um, the, you are supposed to get your factors, they're supposed to be distributed to you a year ahead of the, before they are actually used, so that it gives you an opportunity to know what is expected of you. And sometimes that doesn't happen. So if there are, and that's to prevent people from shifting what their expectations are and, you know, and make it really difficult to do. So you, you have the right, it's in the contract, that they're, the administration is supposed to distribute the factors you're going to use, they're going to hold you to, a year before the evaluation. So I'll we'll keep that in mind. But remember, the factors are a creature of all you guys. So uh, it really shouldn't be a surprise. Um, and what Michelle is talking about is, yes, there is a contractual deadline for when revised factors have to be finalized. But it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that the factors are being revised because you should either there should be a committee or all, all y'all should have a voice in how those factors are being developed. At that point, it becomes a function of college factors. I'm not in. Where, where are you? I work in student disability services. I'm sorry? Student disability services. So the Division, Division, Division of Academic Affairs, and they're probably dusty in somewhere. Um, yeah. So, which, again, would call for, there's been a lot of changes over time, so there's I'm not even sure. The provost office probably I don't should have to maybe. But in lieu of, if you don't have, for right now, if you don't have factors, then what we it falls to is your the job description that you were hired in. If that's evolved, then making sure that what's reflected in your professional record mm -hmm. identifies the things that areas of your responsibility, and that that you and your supervisor agree that that's what it looks like. Um, so again, it's an early conversation. So just saying your your job description. Sometimes you're you're hired and you're you're 
agreement letter may have bullet points of what's there, uh, but if that's changed, you don't pull just back to that. But that's a starting place. If that if that's still what you're doing, then that's that's the place of the factors. But then how do you like measure development? Because what I was hired to do, I'm assuming like I've been here a few years, is that's different. Like I would expect that my job description to evolve over time. So I feel like that's something that's confusing in preparing this document if you have no factors. And I've asked, and it's always been, look at the job description and be hired on, but like that isn't necessarily in line with a normal progression of development in my office. The other default document is the university staff factor statement. I mean, it's those two together. Yeah, it's those two together. It's those, it's the current job duties. Measured against the overall university factor statement, in in the absence of any other factor statement. And part of reconciling that and working with that is something. One of the areas that will be discussed and worked on in the um, the promotional professional record workshop, because that does it, it varies. That, that's a great, it's a great question and it is a challenge that others have um, as well. And but that's the kind of thing we can dive into more deeply. Um, that, well, so, but go ahead, Gail. Um, for somebody who started in November as an academic staff person, mm -hmm. and they'll be submitting from that date all the way up, they still would have to submit their stuff for this year. Yes. Correct? Yes. Yeah, there's contractual uh, dates of when you <coughs> have to be in the pool and the expectation that you'll be here in the fall. As long as you are employed on, I just updated the date, some date in May. Uh, okay. On May 16th, so this coming May 16th, as long as you're in the bargaining unit on May 16th, and again, you are expected to be in the bargaining unit on August 18th, you need to participate in this year's selective salary process. Again, the selective salary and across the boards are all applied on the first day of the university year. They're on the Provost website. Oh, that's not going to override classes, though. No, no, it doesn't. No. So the higher hierarchy is that it is expected that department, if there are department or unit factors, will be consistent with college or division factors, which are expected to be, co be consistent with university factors. Now, that means that the unit factors may be much more specific about some things, College factors will be less specific, and the least specific really are the university factors. Any more questions before we go ahead? Um, well, um, I just wanted to ask about the, the workshop coming up. Um, what exactly will that be like, tackling or diving? Which one are you referring to? The... The professional record is a march that's supposed to longer. Is that going to be on a Thursday or a Friday? I don't remember. It's it's a Thursday or Friday. I think we were shooting for Friday, but they, it's it's going to be longer than a lunch period. It will be a few hours, so that, which is why I think we were looking for a Friday. Um, I'm participating in, with it, but not not leading it, so I can't tell you right. exactly. Um, if there's somebody here from that, it's on the calendar. Should sure. there anybody who can show the calendar? It's on the calendar. On the, on the, but I don't have the date in front of me. Um, but what it's going to get into is those deeper, in, more individual questions, because we'll be in roundtables where there'll be some of the senior folks who are mentored and, and I usually say that we're available for questions with those who want to come in with their actual documents and get into some of the things that we usually don't have time for here, and we always encourage to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. <laughs> well, we're going to get together and have a few of those and then be able to, to, to get some synergy and, and share um, make that more collaborative, but just really a roll your sleeves up and everybody participating um, type of thing. Okay, and I, I also just wanted to um, share that what we have started in our department, our division, um, we meet monthly and we kind of go over, we're still like working through the, every section of the document. So even if we do have some uniformity amongst our department, like at least the committee can get the same document 20 times and see that yeah, uh, it's yeah, the sure. same. So. Great. That's, that's There's great. nothing wrong with that. One, one of the other issues that you need to probably understand about Wayne State 
typical of the constitutional universities. Wayne State, Michigan, and Michigan State are constitutional universities. They have great autonomy, and that sense of autonomy has spread throughout the institution. There's little other than the collective bargaining agreement and a few guidelines documents that the provost can actually, I've, I've sometimes said, I may have a couple of carrots, but I don't have any sticks in my arsenal because many, many things are at the college or division level where the top level, the vice president of the division of research will set policies that affect the division of research. As long as they're not in conflict with any of the collective bargaining units, that's that division's business. In each of the schools and colleges, there's there are a number of faculty and staff committees that have input into the policies of that school and college. What class decides won't affect school of business administration. What SBA decides won't affect fine arts. So, it, it I understand, but one of the things that people from outside universities often don't understand is we're not Fords. There's not one policy that affects every single employee at, at Wayne State other than you got to keep your time records. You know, you got to report to work. But other than that, um, I think the autonomy of the units is actually one of the strengths of the university system. And believe me, I've worked in the University of Texas system where everything was set out by the system office in Austin and every, it was one size fits all. At the time, 14 academic units and 13 health science units. So 27 units were having the same sets of, of rules and regulations applied to them. The professional record workshop is on uh, Friday, March 18th. We don't have a place on the uh, timing. But it'll be, it'll be, so, it'll be, so it's a Friday. And it'll be for at least a couple, two or three hours. It's going to be it longer. It won't be a lunch function, I don't think. It's going to be totally just something to help. I think you were playing with one-on-one. -on -one yeah. So there'll be, there'll be tables with folks so you can come in and bring in and work. There'll be more information coming.